History at WVU, an assistant editor of West Virginia History, the Journal of Regional Studies, and a member of the Governor's West Virginia Sesquicentennial of the American Civil War Commission. How about that? And she's here today to talk about uh, to help us celebrate National Freedom Day, which commemorates the signing by President Lincoln of what would become the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolishing slavery. She will also be at Independence Hall on the 19th of this month at 2 to present another program called With a Torch in Their Souls, the Underground Railroad and the Abolitionist Movement in Western Virginia. Please welcome Dr. Connie Rice. Thank you. I hope I didn't hit this down so it would be too loud because I have a tendency to talk loud anyway. I also have a tendency to talk too fast, so if I start going too fast, just raise your hand and say, slow down. <laughs> um, when Sean asked me to do this on the 13th Amendment, I thought, oh my, that's a hard one. Um, it's hard for a lot of reasons. Um, without the 14th and the 15th Amendment, the 13th Amendment really didn't have a lot of bite. And when you start talking about the 13th Amendment, you also have to start thinking about things like um, too close to my face. You have to start thinking about things like what does your freedom really mean? Um, a lot of questions like that. Uh, James McDowell, who was the governor of Virginia, I'm going to read you a quote from him. It's also one that I have on the next lecture at Independence Hall. You may pace place the slave where you please. You may dry up your utmost the fountains of his feelings, the springs of his thought. You may yoke him to your labor as an ox, which liveth only to work, and worketh only to live. You may put him under any process which, without destroying his value as a slave, will debase and crush him as a rational being. You may do this, and the idea that he was born to be free will survive it all. It is allied to hope of immortality. It is the earthrealm part of his nature which oppression cannot reach. It is a torch lit up in his soul by the hand of deity and never meant to be extinguished by the hand of man. This was the Virginia governor. Um, when they were debating the 13th Amendment, this congressman from New York instead turned around and says, we've got our things backwards here because Governor McDowell was from the Confederate state and Fernando Wood was from New York. Um, he said, we may amend the Constitution, we may by superior military force overrun and conquer the South, we may lay waste their lands and destroy their property, we may free their slaves, but there is one thing we cannot do. We cannot violate with impunity or alter the laws of God. The Almighty has fixed the distinction of the races. The Almighty has made the black man inferior and served by no legislation, by no partisan success, by no revolution, by no military power can you wipe out this distinction. You may make the black man free, but when you have done that, what have you done? Um, this was up from Harper's Weekly, in Emancipation and all the different views of it. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation that he issued uh, in September 22nd, 1862, and it became effective January 1st, 1863, um, really is the beginning of emancipation. Slaves, even in Western Virginia, started running away by droves then, going to Union lines. The Union was in Western Virginia by then. However, his proclamation did not cover the 800,000 slaves that existed in border states that were slave states, like Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. So even though he admitted, issued this proclamation, and it was official in January, slaves in Western Virginia were not free. And they will not become free until we ratify the 13th in, on February 3rd, 1865. Um, when he issued this, he, from the time he issued it, he was afraid that this Emancipation Proclamation would be seen as nothing but a war measure, but it wasn't legal. And it wouldn't help slaves to become fully free until he passed an amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, when you look at the Emancipation Proclamation, you can see what it didn't cover. That's the states in blue. Okay, all the slaves in those states remained in slavery. What he did by the Emancipation Proclamation was set free all slaves in states in rebellion, which he really had little to no control over, which is all the states in red. 
Um, it did have a great bit of practical impact on the religious meaning of safe slavery because slaves ran away from the South in great numbers after the Emancipation Proclamation. And we know they did that in Western Virginia too. So it was really the beginning of the end of slavery. Um, however, the 13th will end it legally. There is another 13th Amendment. Can all of you know that? Um, prior to the Civil War in February of 1861, Congress had passed a 13th Amendment for an entirely different purpose, which was to guarantee the legality and the perpetuality of slavery in the United States. Um, then the war broke out, and it was never ratified. So the 13th Amendment becomes the one to end slavery instead. Um, the 13th Amendment was used to officially prohibit slavery and abolish slavery and involuntary servitude, except when it comes to punishment. If you're legally convicted of something um, for a crime, then you can have involuntary servitude. Uh, that's still a question of debate over the 13th Amendment today, particularly with the issue of whether African Americans are unfairly um, treated in the court system and in the prison system. Um, he had difficulty, he didn't have difficulty gaining passage for the amendment. He has to try it several different times. Um, and this is a legislature that has no Southern representatives when he's trying to pass the 13th Amendment because they've already seceded. Uh, so it's just Northern and border state representatives. <coughs> but still he has problems with trying to get it passed. Um, the 13th Amendment, unlike most provisions in the Constitution, is self-executing. It entirely and directly reaches private individuals rather than the states. Everything else is geared towards forcing the states with compliance. But the 13th says individual slave owners must give up their slaves. It is also the First Amendment in our United States Constitution that mentions the word slavery by name. Our Constitution, even when we talk about um, the Slave Act that was included in our United States Constitution when we talk about ending African slavery. They never mention the word slave or slavery in our Constitution until the 13th Amendment. So it's important for that reason, too. But when we talk about abolition and freedom in Western Virginia, we have to ask ourselves a lot of different questions. Um, because we're a border state, it's very confusing in this state. Because our founders were both slaveholders and um, not necessarily abolitionists, although there were a few of them, but they were, a lot of them, anti-slavery for various reasons. Um, it's a very um, contentious issue in Western Virginia. So first of all, you have to say, what is freedom? What makes you free? What would you all say? How would you define freedom? Ability to vote? Does the 13th give slaves that? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to come and go. Freedom to come and go. Freedom to be. Freedom to live where you want. Freedom to have the job you want. The 13th Amendment guaranteed blacks none of those. Um, so how effective is it? How is freedom achieved in Western Virginia? Well, it's achieved in a variety of ways. It can be by running away, um, which is not legal, of course. Um, it can be by manumission, which, what is manumission? Does everybody know? Yeah, it's a legal document that frees slaves by their owners. Uh, or it can be done by state and federal law. There's not a lot of choices, is there? So then you think about what constitutes freedom, and that comes back again to, do you have the ability to live where you want, um, to have the job you want, to vote? sit on a jury to testify in court? Um, or is, are you really free if the only thing you have is your physical freedom? Uh, it's degrees of freedom, what you actually have. Uh, the 13th Amendment isn't going to give anybody a whole lot. When we talk about slavery in Western Virginia, I put these up as examples. I mean, there are, I have so many PowerPoints with so, many, with so much information and trying to keep this small enough, short enough to talk to you all about it. I thought, what do I want to get across? One of the things is that slavery in Western Virginia is paternalistic, just like it is in the rest of Virginia. Um, this picture is up here because the little boy that's on the left, the little boy that looks apparently white, uh, is considered a slave. 
He was sold south from Lewis County. He was picked up by Benjamin Butler and three other slaves at an orphanage. But he is the child of a slave owner and his slave. And his name is Charles Taylor. So whose child is he? He's Alexander Scott Withers. How many of you know who that is? From Lewis County, he wrote Orders of Chronicle Warfare. He was a historian early on in Western Virginia of several slaves. Um, and he sells his son south. So on one hand, they like you to think they're paternalistic, but on the other hand, they're selling their own children to the deep south to be sold into slavery. This is an example of commissioners um, appointing someone to give slaves away after the state is settled, turning them over if he doesn't designate who they go to. Um, and you'll find these in a lot of courthouses. Promissory notes, you have a lot of slaves who are hired out. This one is from Samuel Cabell, which is a very well-known name in the southern part of the state, for the hire of a Negro girl called Susan. Um, the auction block on the west side of the upper end of the market here in Wheeling um, was a movable wooden platform about two and a half feet high, six feet square, and was approached by some three or four steps. It stood on the left side where you go across the suspension bridge down. Um, one person talking about the slave couple outside the city hotel in Wheeling in 1851 says, I was sitting on the piazza talking with this man when a couple of slaves came in front of the house and were hustled along by the driver. The men were fine looking fellows, although they were barefooted and most of them bareheaded. They were chained by the right wrist to a long bar of iron. The women were not fettered. Some of them carried infants in their arms and some children rode on the wagon with the corn on which they were fed. They soon started toward a steamboat lying at the levee and were shipped for the New Orleans market. West Virginia became known as a slave-raising state in the years leading up to the Civil War. No longer were slaves used in the eastern part for tobacco. The land was worn out. Uh, it was never popular in Western Virginia. It's getting less popular. So to get your money out of slaves, you sell them south, where they're very, very, very valuable. You get a lot more money out of the cotton industry. These are slave topics. This one, the one on the left, was drawn by Joseph Distaparn, the creator of our state seal. Uh, down south of Wheeling here a little bit. He reported a slave couple going through. The other one on the right is from a slave couple going to the Ohio south of the Gully River. Okay. Horrors of the internal slave trade. Uh, a correspondent of the Chillicothe Metropolis reports the steamer Herman lying at Guyandot, Virginia, frozen in with 80 slaves aboard, chained two and two with a long chain between similar to the manner in which horses are fastened for driving. He says that on one cold night, several of them had their ears and their toes frozen. The mate of the boat, Mr. Newton, threatened to raise a company to liberate them unless they were placed in more comfortable quarters. The long chain was loose, which allowed them to gather around the stove. Their groans from the intense cold were said to have been pitiful. These slavers were brought up in Charleston, Virginia, for the southern market, and it is stated that several hundred of their relatives and friends made them a last farewell at the shore as the boat left. So don't think it was milder. Slavery in any form was milder in Western Virginia. There may not have been as much of it, but it was just as ugly. Um, we talked about this already. On the other hand, when we talk about running away, this is one of the ways to freedom. Um, they have marked out the different paths to the Underground Railroad in Western Virginia. And you can see those by the yellow marks. Um, some of them run through Martinsburg, Shepherdstown going into Pennsylvania. You can see them in Morgantown going across the Monongahela River. There are several incidents of slaves running away from Harrison County, coming to the Monongahela River in Morgantown and taking the river, um, <coughs> up river, down, down river. It flows up and north. Um, and where is it going to take them? <coughs> if you get on the Monongahela River, how far is it to freedom? <coughs> Well, just eight miles, really, because you're in Point Mary, PA, and Brownsville, and heading towards Pittsburgh. And you will see lots of families that escaped all through those um, cities in Pennsylvania settling there. And slaves actually moving freely back and forth across the border before the war to visit and come back. Um, things were a little lenient at times. Uh, you can see up here around Wheeling, you can see that slaves ran away both directions, some to Ohio, some to Pennsylvania, that there were different paths. Um, one of the well-known ones was at Bethany helping slaves escape. 
You can see coming from Harrison County, going across towards Belfry, all along the Ohio River, <coughs> hot spots for the Underground Railroad. Um, However, the Underground Railroad, a lot of people portray it as a very romantic thing, and everybody wants to have ancestors that helped on the Underground Railroad, right? There were Quakers and various religious groups that helped on both sides, but the majority of people who helped on the Underground Railroad were blacks themselves. Um, there were a lot of free and slaves on the western side of the Ohio River that risked their own lives to get other blacks to freedom. And the same thing happens across the other side of the river as well. You can also see slaves coming up from further south from the Virginia border, from um, southern West Virginia, going over to Gallipolis on the other side, where there were often abolitionists waiting to help them. In Wheeling, as early as 1829, there begins abolitionist movements going on. Um, the African Liberator is a newspaper that was semi-monthly published in Wheeling. Um, it advocated the emancipation of the oppressed and degraded sons of Africa, guaranteed them freedom by heaven and the rights of the common man. Um, it has all kinds of things on slavery, abolition, colonization societies, literary societies, all kinds of things. Uh, I don't think that was very popular in Wheeling in 1829. In the summer of 1844, there is an anti-slavery party formed in Wheeling as well in Ohio County. Men on the ticket included Joseph Bryant of Brook County, who was once in prison but tried in Wheeling on charges of helping escape slaves. John Gilmore of Ohio County, who was a justice of the peace in 1839, and he was also known for sending a petition to Congress to eliminate slavery in 1832 to eliminate slavery in the District of Columbia. That's something that Western Virginians also did. They petitioned Congress in 1831, 1832, um, from various counties, in particular Ohio County and Lewis County, where people signed a petition to eliminate slavery in our capital. That didn't make them very popular in the home state. Um, the first town ever founded by free blacks is an area outside of Charlestown called Johnsontown. It is set aside 14 acres in 1848 for free blacks to settle there. Remnants of the settlement are still there. People, blacks, still live in that town. Um, you can still see the schoolhouse and the church and different things there. Um, the church and the cemetery are still there. A lot of the resident names are still the same. We have seen some pleasant anti-slavery meetings on the utmost verge of Washington County, PA, made up chiefly of Virginians who hitched their horses on the other side of the Mason-Dixon while they heard our gospel gladly on the free soil of Pennsylvania from our friend Dr. Lemoyne, who by his able and untiring labors has made himself responsible for much of the anti-slavery sentiment now cultivating itself within the Virginia border. Dr. Lemoyne was a physician in Washington, PA, who often came to Wheeling and across the river from the Montevideo River as well, and peddled his anti-slavery sentiment among people. Um, he was pretty well known. He was also a well-known abolitionist in Pennsylvania and was on the Underground Railroad going north. The Liberty Herald says in 14 of the western counties of Virginia there were, according to the census of 1840, but 2,419 slaves. In Wheeling, the slaves were as 1 to 80 of the whole population. In Winchester, they were one of six and in Shepherdstown, one of seven, while in Richmond and Norfolk, they were nearly one to three. In Western Virginia assures the editor of the Examiner that if it were left to the people to say by counties whether slavery should cease, that tomorrow they would vote for freedom west of the Blue Ridge. In 1847, I don't think he was quite accurate. He was talking um, as an abolitionist. It wasn't that well known. Um, there were still a lot of slave owners who were demanding their property rights. But it's different in different areas. Probably the harshest areas are the places with the least slaves, surprisingly enough, and the biggest fear of free blacks later on. Reverend Mr. Wheeler from the True Wesleyan writes, since you heard from me, I have moved into Mason County, state of Virginia, where I'm kind of received by the people of Virginia. Here in Western Virginia, abolitionists, good and true of the right stamp, can do a great amount of good, and the people are as much open to conviction as they are in the non-slave holding states, and perhaps more. 
They generally entertain wrong views respecting the great body of abolitionists. These views have been formed from the malconduct of some raving fanatics called by the wrong name hitherto, and the misrepresentations of our enemies. So the abolitionist movement is moving along in Western Virginia. And we have yet another abolitionist paper created in Moundsville called The Crisis. Um, the editor of The Crisis says, one object, and we may say the main objective, we have is presenting the public with this weekly visitor is emancipation, a thing that is now absorbing both the North and the South. Um, and it's pushing for abolition in 1849. At the same time, when you have slaves running away, you still have them being returned. But what's going to change in 1850? Does it get stricter? Fugitive Slave Act. Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is passed. And then what's going to happen? Slave owners will have what behind them? The federal government. The federal government and law to actually go to court and say, this is my slave and I want her to return, or him to return, whatever. Um, this is back to the Daily Enterprise, talking about we are anti-slavery, body and soul, now and forever. We go against enslaving the body, enslaving the mind, the tongue, the press. What does this newspaper sound more like? Does it sound like a religious abolitionist paper? Um, more moral side of it? Many of the people who were anti-slavery in Western Virginia were not really abolitionists for a moral reason. Um, they did it because they believed in free labor ideology and thought that um, having slaves retarded their economic growth. Uh, we see that with Henry Ruffner, who's a minister, who goes to the Virginia legislature and he talks about gradual abolition. Okay? Um, abolitionists support him. They say, no, he wants to abolish slavery. But if you read Ruffner's address, what does he say? It hurts the economy. It hurts our economic interest to have slavery. Does he necessarily want slaves to stay in the state? Does he want free blacks to stay in the state even if they're gradually emancipated? No. But he liked to end slavery because he thinks it hurts the industrialist business. Um, Many slaves do achieve manumission legally. Particularly after the American Revolution, Virginia is well known for all the slave owners that freed a lot of slaves. Because you have all this um, rhetoric of independence and freedom, and all men are created equal, and they find out that it doesn't, it doesn't coincide to have, on one hand, be complaining about oppression and then be oppressing other people. So a lot of people start manumitting slaves. Uh, that will end some when we have some slave revolts in, West, in Virginia, uh, like Nat Turner's revolt. Gabriel Crozier does it early in the 1800s, then Nat Turner in the 1830s. But there are still people who are manumitting their slaves. When this happens, there is a law that's been passed in Virginia from 1806 on that says any slave manumitted in the state of Virginia has to leave the state within one year. They cannot stay. They don't want a free black population. So what you get when slaves are manumitted by their owners is a lot of petitions to the legislature, to the assembly of Virginia, um, wanting to stay in the state. They don't want to leave. And we're going to go over a few of them here. In December of 1811, in Harrison County, 45-year-old Wagner, Jerry, and his wife, Susanna, are emancipated by the will of their owner, and they petition to stay in Virginia. They have four children who are still slaves and who are being sold to someone else. Jerry's mother also lives with them, who is so old and infirm that she could not be removed, and so she, and she lives with them. The legislature says, no. Jerry and his wife cannot stay in Virginia. It doesn't matter if you have slave children here. You have to leave. December of 1811 in Jefferson County, Catherine Carlisle, a free woman of color, is emancipated by her owner, and she fears she will be taken up and sold as a slave if she does not leave the state of Virginia. And she petitions the state to allow her to remain in Virginia with her husband. Rejected. Pocahontas <coughs> County, 1826, Ben and his seven-year-old daughter, Tamer, are freed by the will of his owner, and they request to remain in Virginia, where his owner has also left him 300 acres of land. It's not going to be 
um, a burden on anyone, is it? Rejected. Uh, this was also accompanied by 151 relatives of his former owner, and it's still rejected. 1820, 1829, Cyrus, a recently emancipated black, says he has wife and children who are slaves who reside in Virginia, and praised the passage of a law permitting him to live or reside in the state as a free man. Rejected. 1829, Berkeley County, 60 residents asked that emancipated slave Daniel Parker be allowed to remain in the state of Virginia and not be forced to leave his wife and several children who are still slaves. Rejected. December 1830, Lewis County, Nathan, a man of color, petitions the state to remain that contains a memorial of about 80 respectable gentlemen of Lewis County requesting that he be allowed to stay. Rejected. 1836, Nicholas County, 150 residents petition in support of Isaac, a recently emancipated black. Rejected. Harrison County, 52 citizens and slaveholders asked that a free man of, of color, Henson, be allowed to remain in the Commonwealth, stating that he had a wife and children in the county and would implore you to set up residence in nearby Ohio or Pennsylvania and visit the family. However, the petitioners assert that from the clamor which is going on in those states upon the subject of abolition, we judge that we should have more to fear from that source than being, from his being permitted to remain among us. Rejected. 1839, Harrison County, 50 citizens asked that Rachel be allowed to remain in the county. Uh, saying that her husband is a slave and he would run away after her and the owner would lose his property. Rejected. Um, Preston County, 197 residents petitioned in support of Thomas and Lavinia McCoy, who have also been left a very profitable estate by their late master. Rejected. Okay. Um, sometime after the late 1840s, these petitions through the legislature will be sent to a committee for courts of justice and you don't always see the results that you saw earlier. At the same time that you have people supporting slaves in their emancipation, supporting them to stay, you have other counties and people saying, they all say the same thing, but it's Montegate County, Morgan County, Berkeley County, Kanawha County, Jefferson County, over and over, and they're all petitioning for the same thing. We regard the residents of a free black population among us as highly injurious and depreciate its increase as an intolerable burden and that the plan of African colonization presents a cheap, certain, and humane remedy to this growing evil. So are we a little mixed up in Western Virginia? On one hand, you have people supporting these slaves and their emancipation, wanting them to stay, and on the other hand, you have 46 citizens, 75 citizens, 10, 43, 159, saying we don't want free blacks among us. Present day West Virginia in 1860 had a white population of approximately 378,000 people. A Negro population, slave population of approximately 18,000, and almost 3,000 free blacks of color. Um, the populace in Western Virginia was not abolitionist in temper. Even Governor Pierpont he was somewhat anti-slavery. His wife's family from Pennsylvania were abolitionists, but Pierpont wasn't exactly. Um, yet he defended a black who was on trial for, set for helping slaves escape um, and felt fine about it. And he talks about what he owes to blacks in some of his letters, in the early statehood letters. Um, the northern hand can handle, even with its own slaves that are here, and there are slave owners in Wheeling, uh, began to take more hold to this free state outlook that they have in the Northwest. Still the slave trade is present all up and down the Ohio River and what becomes the Eastern Panhandle in the new state has the highest number of slaves in what becomes Western Virginia. Berkeley and Jefferson County have the highest number of slaves before the Civil War and they will have the highest free black population after the Civil War. Um, people used to say that Western Virginia, the majority of people were union, that we had a lot more soldiers fighting for the North and the South. Historians have changed that around, re-estimated it from all estimates. There were just about equal numbers of Union and Confederate soldiers from the state. So it's a very confusing state when it comes to the issue of slavery. Um, yet most people, even our founding fathers, weren't really concerned over the issue of slavery. It's not something that they were wanting to do one way or another. They just didn't care. They didn't like abolitionists, but they didn't like slave owners either. They hated the slave owners in Eastern Virginia. Um, so they're just on the fence in a lot of ways. 
So when it comes to asking for statehood, and your people are equally divided, and your leaders are equally divided, how are you going to solve this problem in creating a state? Can this newly created state of West Virginia ask for statehood from Lincoln and his cabinet and from Congress when they are a slave state? Or how are they going to get around this? They have to do something, don't they? Congress is not going to give them statehood if they're a slave state. Well, they do. They're the last slave state we've been to the union. Technicality, right? Um, controversy among statehood leaders. Um, it starts early in 1861 when we're talking about creating a new state. John Vance of Harrison calls for a vote against a proposal to absolve Union soldiers from enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. He doesn't want them to have to send slaves back. George Porter of Hancock and William Borman of Tyler did not want to introduce this Negro controversy into our legislation, with Porter later stating that he hoped we would keep the nigger out of this body. They don't want to talk about it at all when it comes to statehood. Fontaine Smith of Marion refers to the presence of abolitionists, but stated that he believed slavery was constitutionally, religiously, politically, and socially right. Is this the thing you expected your statehood leaders to be saying? Others denied being abolitionists, saying they were neither opposed to slavery or the law, stating that no member was opposed to the fugitive slave law. law. They just wanted the issue out of the discussion. They don't want to talk about it. Nashway John Carlisle defended slavery against any interference, and Waitman T. Willie denied this was a war of subjugation or for the purpose of interfering with the rights for established institutions of the states. What was this a war for? Was it over states' rights? What is the war over? Slavery. Because if you're talking about states' rights, why do states want their rights? <coughs> to maintain the institution of slavery. Um, that's the big issue. That's the whole big issue when people apply for statehood in the territories. They want one free state, one union state, or one confederate state, because they have to keep um, representation, equal commerce. Um, however, this question of slavery is impossible to silence in our statehood movement. They have to talk about it if they want to become a state, as much as they'd like to ignore it. Voters approved the ordinance to create a new government on October 24, 1861, and elected members to a convention to write the new constitution. A constitutional convention meets in November of 1861, and of course, there's going to be a problem. Most were hoping that the federal government would grant statehood without the Emancipation Clause. But a lot of them know this just isn't going to happen. Some delegates, such as Methodist Minister Robert Hager, Lord Mattel, William E. Stevenson, and Granville Parker favored gradual emancipation. Now, truth be told, Hager and Mattel were abolitionists, and they wanted to eliminate slavery. But in this convention, and with the people they had there, and the comments you heard just a minute ago, um, were they going to get a total abolition? No. So they start pushing for gradual emancipation. When Gordon Mattel proposes his emancipation clause, Granville Parker recalls, I discovered on that occasion, as I never had before, the mysterious and overpowering influence the peculiar institution had on men otherwise sane and reliable. Why, when Mr. Mattel submitted his resolutions, a kind of tremor, a holy horror, was visible throughout the house. And again, it's tabled, they don't want to talk about it. Mr. Hager of Boone proposed that whereas Negro slavery is the origin and foundation of our national troubles and the cause of the terrible rebellion in our midst that is seeking to overthrow our government, and whereas slavery is incompatible with the word of God, detrimental to the interests of a free people as well as wrong to slaves themselves, therefore resolved at the convention, inquire into the expediency of making the proposed new state a free state and provision be inserted for the gradual emancipation of all slaves within, within the proposed boundaries of the new state. Anti-slavery delegates to the convention are in a minority, but they have a voice in Wheeling, and they also have a voice in the Wheeling Intelligencer, um, who is very anti-slavery and talks out for the anti-slavery movement. 
Slavery is part of the consideration for the new boundary of the state. It has to be considered in that. People do not want to include the eastern panhandle counties of Jefferson and Berkeley and Morgan because that would more than double the number of slaves they have to figure out what to do with. That's where the majority of slaves are. So there's this huge debate about whether we take those counties in or not. Why are they taken in? <coughs> B&O Railroad. They tried to keep all the counties that had the B&O. Um, Warren Motel becomes the Charles Sumner of the convention. He introduced the first of three proposals that he makes for emancipation. It is always sent to committee and it is always ignored. In January of 1862, Joseph Snyder gives an abolitionist speech too, brings it up again. Most of the delegates do not want to talk about it. This is Stevenson who will later, on the left, who will later become one of our governors and Gordon Mattel. Um, Intelligencer reports the nigger. The members of the House of Delegates accidentally hit upon the nigger yesterday, and a somewhat lengthy discussion ensued. There has been a studious effort to keep Sambo out of the House, and the members have succeeded pretty well. They're still trying to ignore the subject. And of course, Patel submits his second proposal for emancipation. Patel makes a third proposal in February, actions taken, but not for emancipation. It was a proposition to prevent slaves and free Negroes from entering the state. So what are our statehood leaders thinking about? If we're going to have to get rid of slavery, what do we want? Do they want blacks to remain in Western Virginia? No, they want to make it a white state pretty much. Um, so there's going to be more discussion. Patel's address to the people was printed in the Intelligencer, and in June, Welly will petition the Senate for statehood. But there is a requirement put on it by Sumner and other radical um, Republicans that says they must have an emancipation clause in our petition for statehood. Um, Wayman T. Willie will come up with something that will be ratified March 26, 1863. Um, it was passed by the United States Senate actually on July 4, 1862. Perfect day. It's called the Willie Amendment. Does the Willie Amendment give slaves their freedom in Western Virginia? No. Gradual emancipation again. The children of slaves born within the limits of the state after the fourth day of July, 1800. Shall be free. It's one section of slaves will be free. And all slaves within this state who shall at the time after said be under the age of 10 years shall be free when they arrive at the age of 21. And all slaves over 10 and under 21 shall be free when they arrive at the age of 25. And no slave shall be permitted to come into the state for permanent residence. Does this sound like they're real favorable? Um, is there a difference, now here's a question, is there a difference between freedom and equality? Big difference. Of course, right? Big difference. This is Wayman T. Wallach, Willie, who always looks to me like he's four or five of them in these pictures. <laughs> Even though he's from Morgantown, I have to say he's a weird looking fellow. Um, <coughs> this was in the Wheeling Intelligencer in 1863, and it makes you look at things in from both sides here, and how ironic it is. This fellow's writing to the Wheeling Intelligencer who says, how the adoption of this amendment could have the effect of allowing the free Negroes of other states to flock to West Virginia is hard to say. It is somewhat singular that these men love the Negro in one condition and hate him in another. While Sambo crouches beneath the lash of his master, he is a divine institution and all the powers of government are invoked to keep him from running away. We cannot do without him. He is necessary to our domestic happiness. He is our right arm, the very apple of our eye, almost bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. We love to be near him. But invest him with the right of freemen. Give him the right to pay for his labor and away with him. We cannot endure him. He is black, flat-nosed, and woolly-haired and belongs to an inferior race. We cannot endure his presence. Away with him. While they remain as slaves, we will not let them go. <coughs> Or if one should escape, 
we will bring them back again. But we don't want them when they're free. That, that doesn't go together either. Typical Western Virginia, right? Back and forth and back and forth. Of course, what has to come up in the convention is we need to compensate loyal slave owners. If we're going to make them give up their slaves, they have to be paid for them. And they petition for this to happen. Does that happen? No, they don't get compensation. Um, it never happens. January of 1865, the state legislature passes an act to immediately abolish slavery in early January. Wanting to abolish slavery before the federal government enacts it. Make us look a little better, right? In January 20th of 1865, James Ferguson of Cabell County presents a joint resolution to the state legislature for a committee of need to inquire in the expediency and constitutionality of providing the immediate abolishment of slavery. And as usual, it's tabled. January 21st of 1865, Henry McWhorter of Roan County offers a joint resolution advising the legislature to vote for the 13th Amendment pending in Congress. Passed in the House, and it passed in the Senate two days later in West Virginia. Amend there were attempts to amend the bill, trying to get out of it. They were all rejected. February 3rd, 1865, West Virginia ratifies the 13th Amendment and were the first slave state, or former slave state, to do so. However, ratifying the 13th does not improve the status of blacks in West Virginia. They still could not vote, vote. they still cannot hold office. They still can't testify in court. They still can't sit on a jury. Doesn't leave them with a lot of protection, does it? The 13th was ratified by 27 of the 36 states <coughs> in December of 1865. The last state to mess ratify it was Mississippi in 1995. It's a done deal, and Congress had already it is ratified, but the state refuses to do it until 95. And surprisingly, there are a few other states who are just about that late as well. Okay. Which brings to the question, this was my problem when you asked me to speak on the 13th. I mean, how effective is it? What does it give blacks? It gives them their physical freedom, legally. Can't be taken away. Um, but this commitment to giving them their freedom was not a commitment to giving them equality. Um, they're going to be treated unfairly in all spheres of life, economic, politically, socially. Um, there are a lot of different political views in the state, out of the state, about giving freedom some form of legal equality. But when they talk about legal equality, did they mean social equality? No. The majority of legislators in West Virginia believed that slavery could be abolished by statute. And the Constitution that they created in 1863 remained the same. They didn't change that until after they ratified the 13th. They lacked a provision to permanently forbid the institution. A lot of our leaders also thought that blacks were unprepared for the responsibilities of freedom that came with the 13th Amendment. However, the first expansion of civil rights for the freedmen in the state was made in February of 1866 when the legislature granted blacks the right to testify against whites in court. And mostly that was due to Arthur Foreman, who goes to the legislature and says, the recent amendment to the Constitution of the United States completes the abolition of slavery and leaves the colored people in our midst free. A fact that should be borne in mind and recognized. Under the Constitution of our state, they cannot vote or hold office, but they are entitled to security and protection of person and property, which should be guaranteed to them by proper legislation. An important step towards this would be the accomplishment of this purpose, and one, it seems to me, that you should not hesitate to take, is the removal of the restriction upon your competency as witnesses. Until this is done, all other guarantees are fruitless, and these unfortunate people are left to the mercy of anyone who chooses to inflict injury upon them. Because they can't testify in court if somebody does something to them, and they certainly can't testify against whites who attack them. When southern states adopt black codes constricting land ownership, employment, <coughs> agreement, um, tying them to their former owners, we don't do that. 
Um, but the country itself is worried about it. So we passed the Civil Rights Amendment in 1860, or Civil Rights Law in 1866, that um, is just supposed to give blacks more uh, legal rights. There is a dispute over whether or not the 13th Amendment that prohibits slavery gives Congress the power to define and protect civil rights in that fashion against things like black codes. So as soon as it's passed, they know they have to draft and ratify another bill. Because the 13th may have given slaves freedom, but it did not give them citizenship. It did not protect their legal rights. Um, they will reenact the 1866 statute, and it will cut, parts of it will go into the 14th Amendment, and other parts will be enacted again in the Civil Rights Act of 1870. Similar disputes will happen again when it comes to the issue of voting. Um, when we talk about the 13th Amendment and looking at it in the newspapers in Wheeling or Parkersburg or Charleston or anywhere else in, in West Virginia, there wasn't much debate over the 13th Amendment because it had already happened over the Emancipation Proclamation and over how we were going to treat it in our Constitution. How we were going to get statehood by dealing with the issue of slavery. So all the arguments had been made before we ratified the 13th Amendment. So you don't see a lot of issue over that. What you do see is the 15th Amendment. It causes a firm throughout the state, everybody arguing, even people who fought for the Union, who were um, Union soldiers, leadership, nobody, or very few people, Wayne Fee really did, but um, very few people thought that blacks should be given the right to vote. That's something they didn't want to give them. Uh, and it's hotly debated in all the newspapers across the state in 1868, 69, and 70. Blacks go to vote in the state for the first time in the spring of 1870. Um, they remain a contentious issue. Blacks in Parkersburg petitioned the legislature for suffrage as early as March of 1867. However, William B. Stevenson, who was for um, gradual abolition in our state constitution, um, tables it on his motion. Doesn't want to talk about giving blacks the right to vote. In Wheeling, right after the Civil War, blacks worshipped in City Hall. Every Sunday, that's where they went. And often, noisy, lawless white men interfered. Um, they would attack blacks on their way to church. They would attack them as they left church. Um, they were beaten. They were abused. And they had little recourse. In 1869, it probably was our first civil rights court case in Wheeling, it happens in Wheeling, Henry Hollinger boards a um, car of the Citizens Street Railroad Company in South Wheeling. He pays his fare, gets on board, and the conductor stops the train and says, you have to get off. You can't ride inside the car. You can ride outside on the platform. When he argues, he's ready to go off the platform. So Henry Hollinger goes to the railway station, and he complains. They call the police, he's arrested, he goes to jail. Um, and he's found guilty of no other thing than except being black. Okay? They just didn't want to ride for the railroad car. He has fined $10 plus court costs. And so finally he sues the company in court as a civil suit for $2,000 in damages. And the jury agrees with Hollinger. They say he's right. And they award him the sum of 10 cents. Not saying a lot about how much they value him, is it? Um, there's race riot in Malden, West Virginia in 1869. There's also one um, in Charlestown in 1869. Most of this is by Gideon's Bandit. Um, the KKK started in West Virginia as early as hmm, early in 1866. It's here, it's active, particularly in Wheeling. Huge uh, group of KKK were in little tiny Blacksville, West Virginia, Montague County, right on the Pennsylvania line, but extremely active. Um, in 1873, Charles Arter and 64 African, other African Americans from Jefferson County petitioned the state legislature to allow blacks to serve on juries. <clears throat> the governor signs an act approving white males over the age of 21 to sit on juries, but not for African Americans. 
Um, of course, that means that what happens here? What happens in Wheeling? Anybody know? It changes the jury situation? A man named Strotter is tried in Wheeling for killing his wife. He goes to the Supreme Court who says he was not tried by a group of his peers. Um, and the federal Supreme Court says that West Virginia must allow blacks to sit on juries in 1879. It's a federal law by the Supreme Court of the United States. Does that mean that blacks have to that set on juries in West Virginia? No. J.R. Clifford, who was West Virginia's first black lawyer and editor, said it was always amazing to him that they could always find blacks when it was tax time. But when it came time to call for jurors, they couldn't find any of the records. Um, he will be the one that tries and does set blacks on a jury in Martinsburg in 1896. And for his efforts, the white prosecuting attorney takes um, the weights that are in the courtroom and beats him over the head until the blood runs in his shoes. And he has to go home and change his shirt and come back and finish the trial. He loses the case, but he kept the bloody shirt. And when the guy ran for the state legislature two years later, he rode his bicycle. He originally had one of his big front toe bicycles, but then he had different ones. Rode it all over the town square in Martinsburg, so the guy lost the election. Um, after that case, there will not be any black civil jury until 1912, Hancock County. Blacks are a panel on a jury. So what is, is the meaning of emancipation? You have legal freedom from slavery, but it was never intended by our founding fathers to create conditions of legal equality or equality of citizenship. The chains of slavery are gone, but the hands of the freedmen are still tied by the law and by prejudice that continues to exist in our state. And that's the <coughs> Anybody have any questions? Can you know, we still that prejudiced? What? Are we still that prejudiced about things? I suspect we are. Yes. It just it's not as blatant. Um, I have people that I've talked to and interviewed that said in some ways they actually convert segregation because at least they knew what their enemies were. Now it's more hidden with a smile or whatever. Um, I still find the same thing that happened in the 1850s and 60s still happens today, that where you have a larger black population, you have less prejudice, um, which means some of our really rural counties, you can still have a lot of prejudice. Of course, you still have prejudice in the cities. I do, you still see it. It's just, it's not as a birth that it's there. <laughs> when did they integrate the schools? 1954. As soon as Brown versus Board of Education uh, occurred um, in 1954, our governor, Governor Marlin, instantly integrated the schools. West Virginia was one of the first states to integrate the schools. That's not to say that it lasted. We still had some schools in Jefferson County in the late 60s that were still not integrated. And that did not mean that we had culture we were segregated still. I mean, in the 60s, there were lots of protests to try to integrate restaurants, barbershops. Um, um, they weren't allowed to go to the pools. Um, yeah, all kinds of things like that were still going on. And even in the early 70s, I know that there was a mixed race couple, um, black and white, went to the courthouse to get a marriage certificate, and they were refused by our county clerk in the 1970s, even though that was totally illegal. Um, so there's still, still problems with that. Any other questions? Uh, I have a comment, not, not a question. Uh, Michelle Bachman, the Congresswoman, a Republican from Minnesota, um, darling of the Tea Party, said that when there's Founding fathers were drawing up the Constitution. They worked tirelessly to eradicate slavery. And she cited John Quincy Adams as one of the founding fathers. He was not. No. And she's not aware of the Article I of the Constitution that said that for the purpose of taxation 
and for determining how many would be in the House of Representatives, that the Indians and all others were counted as three-fifths of a person. Yes. All, and you mentioned that slavery was not That's mentioned. in our Constitution. That was right. in our United States Constitution. Right. And so uh, three-fifths of it was obviously the slaves. And that language was eradicated in the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. okay. Was she not also aware that we fought a bloody civil war on the issue of slavery? And men of both sides died over the issue of slavery. Yeah. So um, I find it amazing that somebody who was in the House of Representatives. Our Constitution, all of our United States documents, our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution says nothing about slavery. They did not mention it by name, um, even though they talked about it. But what our Constitution did was avoid the issue so that the nation would survive, uh, try to make peace with the South. So we extended the slave trade till 1812. We uh, put in a Fugitive Slave Act, and we had the Three Fifths Compromise. Um, it lasted for quite a while. Well, the Slave Act lasted. It was the only one they operated under until the 1850s. Did you have a question? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> I don't give your talk, but you're on the uh, sesquicentennial commission for the Civil War in Taylor, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I read an article recently, USA Today, I think it was, a couple months ago, that many states are not really budgeting any money at all for this uh, sesquicentennial on the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, is West Virginia, shall we say, in the top? states that's giving money and pushing some effort on this, whereas other states are kind of saying, well, we'll have to try to find public funding. I think it was New York that it doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. um, some of the states that are in trouble and deep debt and are thinking about going bankrupt are not planning on anything. Other states, like Virginia, has really jumped ahead of this. They've been working on it for 10 years before the sex with Centennial. They have all kinds of plans made. They're spending lots of money in it. Um, we were appointed late. Um, just a year or so ago. Um, and the legislature did appoint $100,000 um, to work on things. Um, <laughs> there's still a lot of debate going on the commission of how, we, what we can use that for legally and not, you know, and how to use it. Uh, do we support people in the community with what endeavors they're doing, or do we have our own commemoration and provide leadership and everybody can join under it. I mean, it's still debated and you still have a lot of questions that um, some people, some of us on the commission are more worried about than others, especially when it comes to issues of um, <coughs> diversity, um, what's right and what's wrong. Um, do you support reenactments when you have Confederate flags waving? Um, Issues that, you know, because in South Carolina they're having they're having a Confederate ball to celebrate the Civil War. Um, there's a lot of issues that go on more than I thought that you have to deal with, and um, you get a variety of people from people that want to make it a cultural um, look at what our state went through, the people went through, how that impacts us today and those who just want to glorify the past. Um, so it's a constant battle, I mean, even on the commission. Um, but it's interesting. We're not, we're not spending the kind of money that places like Virginia is. Um, obviously, we don't have that kind of money. We're not spending that kind of money. Um, but we do have some operating money. Is there anything else about that? <laughs> Any other questions? I answered all your questions. <laughs> There's so much more. <laughs>